Hello and welcome to HD's weekly talk show, The Interview, and our special segment, Coffee on Sunday. I want my chair to be the same height as the visitors' chairs, no elevation. This was the first thing Rajiv Gandhi told her when she started redoing the Prime Minister's office. On her part, she told the President that he could not tamper with the design of the Rashtrapati Bhavan. This is not your house. You are a temporary resident here, she is reported to have then said. If she had her way, she would have uprooted the singing fountain in the Rashtrapati Bhavan on which some two crores were spent, an eyesore to quote her. Today she can laugh at Gyani Zail Singh's Minna Puchleakar remark, meaning, ask before you do. But that is not Sunita Kohli's style. A self-taught interior designer, Sunita Kohli is counted amongst the most talented designers in the country. She is also the first interior designer to be conferred the Padvashri. A name to reckon with in interiors and concepts, Sunita Kohli has reworked the Prime Minister's office, the Rashtrapati Bhavan, and Hyderabad House in India, and the Parliament in Bhutan, among other envious projects. Sunita Kohli with us in this edition of HD's weekly talk show, The Interview, where she takes us through her journey of life and work in our special segment, Coffee on Sunday. Welcome to the show, Sunita Kohli, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I consider it a privilege. Let me begin with your work. You have reworked or redone the Rashtrapati Bhavan, the Prime Minister's house and the Hyderabad house. Tell me how did the adventure begin? And don't kill me for using the word adventure. <laughs> no, I love the word adventure actually. Because uh, life in the world of design has been an adventure. One thing has led to another thing. And in 1975, I designed my first hotel. Then I was asked to do uh, the first Obroy Hotel, um, my first Obroy Hotel in Egypt. Where you wore Kolapuri chappals and a sari and were in a plait and people said, Oh God, where has she come from? <laughs> yes, exactly. And also in those Kolapuri chappals, I climbed all the way up to Mount Sinai, Vozamanatha, Kher. Then one was invited in 1982 uh, when uh, Queen Elizabeth was coming as head of Chogam to do just the main rooms in Hyderabad house and a few state rooms in Rashtrapati Bhavan. So that apparently whatever we had done was well liked. My main work in Rashtrapati Bhavan, which was from the literal, uh, literally from the attic to the basement. You worked at the Rashtrapati Bhavan in three phases, as I can understand. Were you able to remove the singing fountain, which to you was an eyesore, and some two crores of rupees were spent on it at that point in time? Unfortunately, I was not able to remove that because I didn't, uh, you know, these are all, this is all government money. And the then president had chosen to spend this money um, on this musical fountain. And removing it would have gone down on paper as infructuous expenditure. But what I did manage to remove was um, something called the thinking hut, which had been placed squarely in the middle of the Mughal Gardens. And the Mughal Gardens to Rashtrapati Bhavan are really very, very special, these 250 acres. The Rashtrapati Bhavan cannot go according to the whims and fancies of any one individual. And particularly if that individual is the first 
citizen of the country. Um, I think the fact that you are living there is fine, but to but to interfere with uh, with uh, you know with the buildings or to make structural changes, I think that should not be allowed because I firmly believe that it, these buildings belong to the nation. I believe you told a particular president, and I will not name him, that he could not change anything or much because he was a temporary resident at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, Kumkum, I was, I didn't put it across like that at all. I was extremely polite, but when a major structural change was being required to close a door with everything happening between the president's study and the drawing room, which was adjacent to it. So I explained, I said, sir, we must really reconsider this because uh, this orfilad of rooms was created by Lachians and we must, we must be respectful of that vision. So it wasn't changed. Okay. <laughs> Your way of working is one-on-one -on -one. and to quote you, that is how design happens. So you did interact with many presidents, several presidents. How was it working or interacting with uh, APJ Abdul Kalam and Venkat Raman, for instance? It's one-to-one -one in the sense that one explains personally. Because otherwise, you know, much can get lost in translation. And that's a way of design all over the world. It's not just special to me. But working with, say, Abdul Kalam, who's a scientist, you were an aesthetic you know, interiors person, or working with Venkat Raman, an intellectual, how how did it translate and how tough was it or was it a smooth sail? What was it like? It used to be quite easy, actually. You know, uh, the person who actually would ask the most questions would be Rajiv Gandhi. He had very short time. He wanted everything put on paper and he, because he could read drawings. So he could very, very quickly, very meticulously look at, you know, whether there were reflected ceiling plans, uh, layouts, electrical layouts, air conditioning layouts. And I think the people who used to suffer the most were the CPWD engineers because he would could catch them on every one thing that they said. We will discuss Rajiv Gandhi a little later. What about Gyadi Zail Singh? He's one of those I'm naming. How much of design did he understand? And apparently at one point, he was very pained. With a pained look on his face, he says, ask before you do. Just take me through that. Well, you know, uh, there was going to be uh, a visit of a head of state and that was going to be held in one of the drawing rooms in Rashtrapati Bhavan. <clears throat> so I had uh, received a message from PMO if I could just set it up in a particular way that MEA and PMO wanted. So I had done that. And I, when I had arrived at that uh, draw, that state drawing room, I found that in the middle of the room, there was um, a model of uh, of Har the Harminder Saab. So I had that carefully removed, taken to a corridor, and I found a wonderful alcove, and I had it placed there. So I got a call. I must say, Yaniji was very polite, and all the only thing he said, Jat tonu kuch cheese hatani hai ji, I apologized profusely and I told him that as soon as the meeting is over, I would bring it back to the same place. So there are many incidents and many... Some you would like to forget or say never again? Actually, I don't think so. My design, my design journey has been so full of adventure and so full of um, you know, new things, new people, new things, that that always has excited me. I mean, there are many things in my life I might want to forget, you know, which are personal because nobody's life is, uh, nobody's life is uh, without its ups and downs. And certainly in my life also, there have been many. But in the design field, no. I think from each project, 
uh, each project added to my learning curve. So I find designing very effortless. You know, in many professions, people then and now look and cringe and say, oh God, what's happening? And how much have things changed? And in many cases, deteriorated in that respective field. Uh, tell me, being a veteran designer and looking back and looking at now, what are the things which you think should not happen? Uh, I think what should not happen, that one must always be very respectful of our history. You know, history you cannot erase. And so you carry forward with your own history. But the good thing that is that I have seen the sea change happening is that now uh, what I find today is that that uh, that we are all uh, and particularly architects are much more comfortable uh, within their own skins of being Indian architects and um, and and kind of uh, looking at our own 5,000 year old culture. I mean, we have so much. Your emphasis is on retaining the original, you know, and in that context, let me ask you, what is your take on the new parliament and the central vista, which has been very, very controversial? Delhi is one of the few planned garden cities in the world. And um, I don't know, if you remove 86 acres from what are public spaces, because today the world over, there is an emphasis uh, in urban spaces that you must increase and plan for public spaces. So I think that that it's it's a it's, it's you have to be conscious of that, and you have to have a conscience about it. And would you say? that in the Central Vista, this rule has been given a go-by. Looking at it, what would you say? From what I've read, certainly it has. And you feel sorry? I feel sorry because I feel sorry because um, uh, it's New Delhi is a brilliantly planned capital city. And there is so much more to do outside. After all, what is it? It's only 32 square kilometers. There's so much that can be done outside this precinct. I think we must we must absolutely preserve our history. You have said, and let me quote, New Delhi will be remembered as the greatest achievement of British in India. Let me ask you, don't you think it is time we came out of the legacy and erase those footprints. One thing I really believe that we must get rid of our colonial mindset. You know, when we were colonized, like many other countries also, they didn't just colonize our lands and our people, but they also colonized our minds. That we must definitely remove. I think history must be kept alive. So we are actually the inheritors of Lachins' greatest work in the world. So I think it needs to be preserved. You just killed my question, which was perhaps <laughs> naive, but I would still attempt to ask. So there is British, there is Mughal architecture. Where is, but again it's probably a naive question, where is post-independent India footprint? All the stone is from Makrana, or it's, you know, they, uh, or it's Kota stone, and plus very much Hindu um, Hindu motifs have been used. I mean, what could be more Hindu than the lotus and elephants? I mean, India without elephants, what is it? Let me ask you, what is your design philosophy, if I'm allowed to use that term, or if a term like that exists? It does exist, and. Uh, my design philosophy is that I am very sentient of the place where I have been asked to design a project because I'm, I'm essentially a research-based designer. I, I like 
the project to uh, to be imbued with the cultural milieu of the place so i am very very conscious of context and uh, and for that i research i travel uh, i travel throughout uh, you know um, whether it's a, whether it's a state like orissa i will see everything i might use 1000th of it so i travel not to reach destinations are not my destiny i travel but for travel's sake on your hit list are artificial plants on the other hand you have said no chair that i have crafted and i use the word crafted needs retouching for 50 years just explain both these concepts to me uh you know by and large i don't like faux material i mean there are flowers you can use simple flowers but why have all these artificial flowers it doesn't matter how expensive they are they made out of silk they made in crafted in thailand whatever it's just i guess it's just me uh so i like i like authenticity i take great pride in the furniture that one has one has manufactured and since i've been in it for 50 years i know that third generations are using my furniture so i guess um that's the proof of it yours was what you have called an accidental start in interiors and if i'm not mistaken you were never trained in interior design the discipline i studied was literature but along the way you know i learned how to restore furniture because i started studying the history of furniture little realizing that all my upbringing in lucknow going to all these kabadi walas you know with my father looking at beautiful things would i it was all being soaked in uh to later become a profession quite by chance traditional as you are your role for jewelry is no diamonds for me because i like traditional ja- antique jadao jewelry so no diamonds for you no diamonds for me <laughs> <laughs> you're the first interior designer who was conferred the padmashri but your critics say it was because of your proximity to rajiv gandhi rather than your talent and work i was given actually the padma shri uh, after rajiv gandhi had passed away so uh i don't know whether that's a fair question actually in my profession one is only judged by one's work and nobody is going to ask you to do a hotel which has been my main uh, which has been my main stay of my my uh, design profession and spend millions of dollars on it if you cannot produce the results what was it like to know rajiv gandhi and how did that relationship begin with the gandhis well the relationship uh, i should say the friendship really began i was introduced to both rajiv and sonia gandhi in 1971 because uh, at a dinner party of other uh doon school people my husband is from doon school and he and rajiv knew each other then then it grew into a grew into a friendship rajiv gandhi made one thing clear to you i want my chair as the same height as the visitors chairs no elevation he said design this for the prime minister of india and not for me and therefore i guess through nine prime ministers his own office I mean the office of the prime minister has remained unchanged because it was done for the position and not for the person that was a very telling thing of character because uh you know when he asked me that I want the height of my executive chair to be the same height as my visitors chairs I mean that tells its own story that was the person he didn't need to show himself to be bigger than whoever may be visiting him you also turned author and said bas chalte chalte kitab likh li maine <laughs> so in various books i have contributed essays and written papers throughout but you've done a book on cooking with your mother yes i did 
And that was actually in the midst of a book which I can now speak about, which I'm in the midst of writing, which will come out next year. It's on World Heritage Sites in India. And uh, my mother was also previously a cookbook author. So this cookbook, um, I mean, my publisher uh, said that we would only do it. Uh, we would agree to publish this book if you co-authored it with your mother. And you wrote a 10,000 word essay. It turned out to be the most difficult thing, the most difficult three months. So it was not like chalte chalte kitab likhli. Meaning chalte chalte meaning in between uh, writing this big book and also there's another big book on uh, on design which I'm working on. So two, three books. So designing is easier and you don't spend sleepless nights. No, no, I never had. It was always some very exciting thing which is fermenting in design but whereas with writing uh, you can reach a pause situation you know <laughs> on that note Sunita Kohli thank you very much thank you for your time and thank you for being here with us thank you so much Kumkum. Kum. it's been a pleasure <laughs>